Now, our first speaker is a lifelong Republican and a candidate for governor for the state of Georgia. He prefers to be called a constitutionalist as he rejects the globalist socialist agenda of many of our politicians and strongly supports a return to the original principles of our founding fathers. By trade, he is a businessman who produces radio and television commercials. By passion, he is a statesman, boldly declaring we live in perilous times and fervently advocating a return to the Constitution and to limited federal government that our founding fathers envisioned. Please welcome back to the stage a lifelong native of Georgia, an organizer of today's event, and your friend and mine, Ray McBerry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to change hats now. I'm going to begin this speech. I thought about doing something a little bit different. I'm going to start this speech, though, the same way that I have started every single speech I have given across the state of Georgia for the last 10 months. And I figured it up the other day. I have spoken on the subject of states' rights and state sovereignty now in this governor's race more than 160 times over the last 9 or 10 months across the state of Georgia. Most of the time, the crowds ranged in, in size around 100 people. So that's a whole lot of people beginning to hear about states' rights and state sovereignty here in Georgia. But I want to start the same way that I start every single one of those meetings. And let me tell you, I start these meetings the same way whether they are excited, enthusiastic Tea Party crowds or if they're dry, dull, usually dead GOP breakfast. <laughs> So I'm going to start by asking you two questions, and hopefully you're awake this morning. The first question I want to ask is this. How many of you in the room this morning would agree that we'd all be better off with a little less federal government in our lives? And the follow-up is how many of you would agree we'd all be better off with a lot less federal government in our lives? And I want you to know that that is the same response that I have gotten to that question every single place that I have spoken, including those normally dry, dull, dead GOP breakfast. <laughs> because Americans are waking up to the fact that there is a cultural war being waged against us here in our own country. And I want to talk to you about that. You know, it really doesn't matter if we're talking about Obama health care or if we're talking about illegals trying to register to vote in our own state elections, or here in Georgia, if we're talking about the water rights battle currently going on between Washington and the state of Georgia, Washington trying to tell us what we will or won't do with our own natural resources, or if we're talking about the attacks, the infringements upon one liberty after another, including the right to keep and bear arms. Those and a myriad of other issues that currently face Americans in every state all have their solution in one very single, simple, peaceful constitutional solution, and that is the Tenth Amendment and states' rights. You know, I shared with you just a few minutes ago the wide array, wide array of candidates that we have participating in this event yesterday and today. Candidates from across the country. But again, I think the thing that's most telling is that it's not just conservative Republicans in this room. Again, there are Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, and Independents, all represented here as candidates at the Tenth Amendment Summit. And I, as, as I mentioned to the candidates in the room last night, the thing that makes that so exciting is that if we talked about the issues, if we talked about the life issue, the Second Amendment issue, if we talked about uh, a bunch of other issues, the truth is these different regions of the country that we all represent, we would not agree on all those issues. But we do agree that it is the right of any people to preserve their valuable way of life. And it is the right of each state to make that decision for themselves. And so we believe and we celebrate the right of self-government. And that's what the Tenth Amendment really at its root is all about. The right of self-government. And by the way, having a bunch of liberals and conservatives working for the same cause totally destroys that old paradigm, that old false paradigm,
that the enemies of our liberty have created for far too long in an attempt to keep us divided and separated so we could not fight together against the enemies of our liberty. And if there's any clear message that ought to come out of this meeting to those behind the scenes in Washington in the shadows of power who pull the strings, it ought to be this. That when they see those of us that are called liberal and those of us that are called conservative coming together in defense of our liberties, the enemies of our liberty today ought to be shaking in their boots because we're awakened now to what's going on in America. Now, before going into business for myself, I was a history teacher for about 10 years. I taught at both the high school and the college level. And um, one of the things that uh, history teachers in particular do, if there's not a definition in the book for something we want to teach or talk about, we just make up the definition. So I, I would dare say that most of the history books in America today and most high schools uh, probably do not even mention states' rights, let alone give you the definition. So I'm going to give you the Ray McBerry definition of states' rights today. The definition of states' rights is the right, and I believe responsibility, of the states to stand up for the people's liberties against the unconstitutional encroachments of an out-of-control federal government. And folks, if there's ever been a time that that was true in America, it's true today. We have an out-of-control federal government. I'm excited about being a Georgian because Georgia has a long, rich history in standing up for states' rights and state sovereignty. And so those of you who are our honored guests from other places uh, in America, let me share with you a little bit of our heritage here in Georgia about standing up for states' rights and state sovereignty. Five short years after the Constitution of these United States was ratified, there was a man from another state who tried to sue the state of Georgia in the federal courts. His name was Chisholm, so the case is Chisholm versus Georgia, 1793. You can look it up when you go home. Now, in the case of Chisholm versus Georgia, the federal judge issued an order to the state of Georgia demanding that the state of Georgia come and appear before the federal courts so that they could hear the case and rule on the matter. Now, here's what Georgia responded in 1793. By the way, these were the founding fathers in 1793. These weren't some people making up their own interpretation of the Constitution. These are the men who wrote the Constitution. 1793, here was Georgia's response. We will not come and appear before the federal courts on this or any other matter because it was the states who created the federal government, not the other way around. Therefore, we're the master and you are our servant. <laughs> And if you like that part, you're really going to like this part. The state of Georgia went on to say that any federal agent caught within the boundaries of the sovereign state of Georgia attempting, attempting to enforce these unconstitutional measures would be, and I quote, arrested and hanged by the neck until dead without the benefit of clergy. Now, friends, I'm here to tell you that the problem we dealt with in 1793, just five short years after the Constitution had been put into place, is the very same problem we deal with today in the 21st century. It is an out-of-control federal government. I think all of us are familiar from our high school history or civics classes uh, with the three branches of the federal government, legislative, executive, and judicial, and how they were all three given checks and balances on each other's power so that no one branch of the federal government became more powerful than the other two branches. But what happens when all three branches of the federal government are out of control? And that's where we're at today. The good news is that our founding fathers were wise enough to see that also. And that's what the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to the Bill of Rights is all about, to part of our Constitution. States' rights and state sovereignty is the solution for all those federal encroachments. And all that remains is for us to have governors and representatives in each of our states who will stand up to Washington and every single time Congress passes one more unconstitutional thing or every time the White House issues one more executive order or every time that self-righteous Sanhedrin of the Yankee Federal Supreme Court issues one more unconstitutional ruling, 
our governors in every state stand up and say, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, show me where you have the authority to do that or keep that stuff out of my state. You know, our founding fathers understood that the Constitution is a contract. And just like that contract that you have with your mortgage company or your bank for your mortgage, uh, that contract is a written binding document. It's not some nebulous idea floating around in space that either party can change on a whim on their own accord. But that's what we're told today by many in Washington that our Constitution is. It's some living, breathing document that just changes with the winds of time. Folks, that's not what it is. It's a contract. And by the way, let me make this very clear. That contract was made between the several states. Those states created an entity called the federal government. The federal government was not party to the original contract. It's a creation of the contract. Therefore, it is only an agent or a servant of the states. It has no ability to stand up to the states and infringe upon their liberties. They are the ones who are parties to the contract. Amen. And it is those states who have the moral and the constitutional obligation to enforce that upon their agent, the federal government. Now I'm going to speak to you just briefly about several issues because I know that we all understand that our liberties are under attack today. How many of you in the room, let me see your hands, how many of you in the room would agree that the right to keep and bear arms is a God-given right? All right. I'll say what I usually say. All the men in the room raised their hand, and I think most of the ladies too. <laughs> you know, the right to keep and bear arms is a God-given right. It's not a right that was given to us by the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment merely acknowledges that right that we already possess. And I understand that the Second Amendment is not the only one of our liberties that is currently under attack. But it is the liberty that guarantees and safeguards all of our other liberties. Because if we lose the right to keep and bear arms, we very quickly, in short order, will lose all of our other liberties. You can mark it down. And you can also mark it down that the enemies of our liberty are coming for our right to keep and bear arms. They've already done it in every other free republic in the Western world, and it is coming to America in fact, the Obama administration just nominated and had confirmed the most anti-gun attorney general in American history in Eric Holder. He is even more anti-gun, if you can believe it, than Janet Reno was under the Clinton administration. Their plans are to take away your right to keep and bear arms. And we'd better start finding elected representatives, beginning with the governor, our state representatives, and congressmen who will stand up for our right to keep and bear arms. I think many of you probably, like myself, heard the horror stories coming out of Hurricane Katrina during the uh, catastrophe just several years ago. When in the aftermath of that storm, FEMA and other federal agents were literally going around trying to confiscate the weapons of law-abiding citizens in the aftermath of the storm. I am not talking about trying to confiscate the weapons of the, the vandals, the looters, the robbers that were breaking into people's homes. I'm talking about federal agents going up and knocking on the doors of law-abiding citizens at their residence and demanding that they turn over their firearms because it was a federal emergency zone. Now let me tell you what any state's rights governor should have said in any one of those states. And let me tell you what Ray McBerry has already gone on record with Fox News in Atlanta is saying months ago that when I become the next governor of Georgia... I will put Washington on notice that the first time I find any federal agent in my state trying to disarm one law-abiding citizen, that federal agent's going to find himself sitting in a Georgia jail waiting for someone to come bail him out. By the way, I have a little more time to speak than most of the other candidates are going to get today. <laughs> so I want to say this on behalf of the other candidates. There is a difference between the candidates who are here with you today in this meeting and those other candidates that they are running against back home. And so if you believe in the principles, if you believe in the principle of the Tenth Amendment and state sovereignty, 
It is your obligation to get behind these candidates. I can tell you, I don't know about those running as Democrats or Libertarians or Independents, but I can tell you the other candidates who are here who are like myself running as Republicans, we stand on the platform many times with those that are running against us in the same races who also claim to be pro-Second Amendment or pro-life or pro-anything else, because, and they say those things because they're Republicans. That's what they say. But there is a difference between saying you're pro-Second Amendment and being pro-Second Amendment. And we'd better start finding candidates for races all across this country from one end of the ballot to the other who believe in our liberties and who are willing to stand up on behalf of the people and even interpose ourselves and every resource at our disposal, if need be, in defense of the people's liberties. You better get behind these candidates who are here today, folks. One of, the, one of the most frequently asked questions when I'm out uh, speaking uh, on the circuit running for governor is, well, Ray, what are we going to do, though, when we take this stand for the Tenth Amendment, which we have a right to do, but the federal government says, okay, you can do that if you want to, but don't plan on getting your education funds next year. Now, I don't know how it is in your particular state. Might be a little bit different, but I bet not a lot. Here in the state of Georgia, every local school system in each county gets a grand total of approximately 3% of their budget from federal funds. Now, we actually have a bill that um, our campaign has helped to write that has been introduced in the Georgia General Assembly that I believe is going to help us get that 3% back and not let it ever go to Washington in the first place, at least from Georgians. But I... I want you to think for a minute, though. The federal government lays down guidelines and rules on which set of textbooks from which your schools can choose, whether your children can pray before their Friday night football game. They tell you what test not only, not only your students but also your teachers are going to be measured by for their success, and a myriad of other things that they decide for you in your local school system. Now, I submit to you, even if I here in Georgia and your representatives in your states could not get back that 3% for you, for your local school budget, would it not be a small price to pay to restore our liberties and regain the control of the destinies for our children and our grandchildren? Let us throw off the yoke of federal tyranny and not sell our children's inheritance for a little bit of mammon. Now here in Georgia, we have a unique situation. We have a water rights battle that's brewing between Washington and Georgia because uh, the Army Corps of Engineers a number of years, years ago dug the hole for Lake Lanier and some of our other reservoirs across the state. And now the federal government, because of that, is telling us, especially with the, the drought we had over the last several years, that because they dug the hole, they have a right to tell the state of Georgia what we will or won't do with our own water supply. Now, this is not popular with a lot of my opponents in the race, and they cringe every time I say it when we're in a public debate, but I'm going to say it again. I think you might like my solution to the problem. I have already stated that as governor, as a state's rights governor, I will let Washington know, fine, that hole you dug in the ground belongs to you. But every drop of water that the good Lord put into that hole belongs to the people of the sovereign state of Georgia. Now, in deference to our friends from Tennessee, Alabama, and Florida who are here, I do believe that we have, a, we have an obligation as good neighbors and as Christians, to sit down with one another and come up with a solution that works to solve the water problem in southeast, uh, the southeastern region of these United States. But I will tell you, I do not believe that sitting down at the table with Washington has any part in that solution. I mean, Washington is real good at creating problems. How many problems have you ever had, though, that they solved for you? Not too many. One of the other things that always gets asked of me is, well, what about our highway funds? That's the number one tool that the feds usually use 
uh, when a state tries to assert its sovereignty. It doesn't matter what it is you're asserting your sovereignty about, they immediately want to pull your highway funds. Well, our campaign, I personally have helped to author a bill that's been introduced in the Georgia General Assembly that's called the State Authority and Federal Tax Funds Act. And I'm very excited about this. It is actually right now being used as a model to, for, for legislation to be written in at least half a dozen other states that I know of. What this bill would do is it would restore the way taxes were paid to the federal government back to the way it was done for the first hundred years or so of American history. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but early in our history, individuals like you and I did not pay taxes directly to the federal government. Instead, the revenue that the federal government needed for constitutional things was raised by generating that from tariffs on imports coming into the country. And if there were times when Congress did other things that were constitutional and they needed additional revenue, their job was to send a bill to the states and the states then would get a bill that was, ba that was a portion based on their population for each state and the states were supposed to come up with them for themselves with however they were going to pay that bill to the federal government. The states decided how they would raise that money and send it in to Washington. What this bill that we've introduced here in Georgia would do is send things back to pretty much the same way it was for the first part of American history. It would require that every Georgian who owes federal income taxes or any other kind of federal taxes would pay those taxes directly to the Georgia Department of Revenue. And then the Georgia General Assembly would do their responsible uh, their constitutional responsibility every year and go down through the list of annual federal appropriations and only those federal appropriations that are deemed constitutional by the Georgia General Assembly would be funded with Georgia taxpayer money. Now folks, we are not talking about something that's uh, some brand new concocted idea. We're just talking about going back to what our founding fathers knew worked in the first place. And if you want to talk about taking power away from Washington, you take their money away from them so they can't hold it over your head. I mean, after all, if someone else took your money and then told you what you had to do to get your own money back, what would you call that? Blackmail, extortion, bribery, any host of uh, charges. But that's what happens to us every day. And by the way, I know every state in here will be different. In Georgia, even when we follow all of their rules, we still don't get all of our motor fuel tax back in, uh, in the form of federal highway funds. Georgia's what's called a donor state. Maybe your state is too, I don't know. Even when Georgia follows all their rules, we only get 90 cents on the dollar back. The rest of it goes somewhere else. It's about time we reclaim control of our money so that we reclaim control and authority for the people and not for Washington. Right. One of the other things that I always have as a hot topic question everywhere that we travel is the subject of jobs, especially because of the way the Bush and Obama administrations have destroyed our economy. And we have a solution for that too from states' rights, state sovereignty, and the Tenth Amendment. Another one of those ten different bills that uh, our campaign has helped to author that's in the Georgia General Assembly right now is the State Authority and Intrastate Commerce Act. You can go, by the way, to our website and see all ten of these bills that we've helped to author. Um, but this particular bill deals with intrastate commerce. Did you know that the Constitution gives Congress the authority to regulate interstate commerce? That is, any business that's transacted across state lines. But it does not have authority under the Constitution for anything, any business that takes place within the boundaries of your state. Although they have used the Interstate Commerce Commission to have their hands in every single one of those areas anyway. What we've got to do is go back to what this act would do. Now, you've probably heard the stories about the Montana gun bill that says that uh, any gun manufactured in the state of Montana is exempt from federal regulations and taxes unless it crosses the state lines of Montana. Tennessee, by the way, has followed that up, as I understand it, maybe with a little better bill, trying to do them uh, one better. But here in Georgia, we're trying to up the ante again. This bill the State Authority and Intrastate Commerce Act actually takes it a step further. This bill says that anything that is grown, 
manufactured, produced, or excavated within the state of Georgia until it leaves the boundaries of this state are exempt from all federal rules, regulations, and taxes. <laughs> Now, I'll guarantee you, if you want to stimulate your economy back home and create jobs overnight, and if you want to find businesses that are looking to stay in America and not move to Mexico or India to set up shop, that are looking for a place in America to still remain, I'll guarantee you, your state would be the place they'd be looking for to come if this was the type of legislation we had in each of our states represented in this room today. And by the way, by the way, those federal agents are at it again. You probably saw the same story I did yesterday in the news, where federal agents are now going to those gun shop owners in Montana saying, fine, we understand what law your state legislature passed, so you can either choose to abide by their laws or you can deal with us. Now, what has happened is it has put those gun shop owners in a very precarious position there in Montana because the bill that was passed in Montana, as good as it was and as groundbreaking as it was, had no teeth to it. But this bill that we've introduced here in Georgia puts teeth to it. It's not just a resolution. It states that any federal agent involving itself in the affairs of Georgia citizens conducting their own commerce will be guilty of a felony in the state of Georgia and punishable not only by a fine but up to 30 years prison in the state of Georgia. As I close out my time, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. This is the right time for our message, ladies and gentlemen. Many of you in this room have been working, praying, hoping all your adult life for an opportunity on the landscape that we have before us today. We cannot afford to say we'll work a little bit now and a little bit next year and a little bit next year. Folks, the enemies of our liberty are pressing in upon us. Our republic given to us by our founding fathers hangs dangerously over the precipice. You and I in this room and those across America who share our beliefs in the Tenth Amendment represent the final, peaceful, constitutional solution remaining to rein in an out-of-control federal government. There is no tomorrow. You or I have no reason that we should expect that five years from now, we'll have the same opportunity we have before us today. Every person in this room, candidate or no, it is incumbent upon us to get involved personally. And I can tell you the people out there are ripe for our message. I said a little while ago, I've given this same speech or something similar to it about states' rights 160 times in the last few months across this state. And I get the same response that you just gave everywhere I give it. Because the people are hungry for their liberties. Many of them don't know what the solution is. They've given up hope. They've thrown up their hands in despair. And they believe it's all lost. We have a message not just of complaining about Washington. We have a message of hope. We have the answer to these problems. And you ought to see the look on people's faces when they're sitting in the audience and they hear for the first time a speaker, a candidate, get up and talk about states' rights, state sovereignty, and the Tenth Amendment. Their faces light up. They get excited. They can't wait to get up to the, the platform to talk to the speaker after it's over because they realize there's hope for America still. Amen. You and I have that message. We have that message. And whether you're a candidate here or not, you have that same message to take back home and share. A lot of people, maybe even in this room, have believed that we could simply go to the ballot box on election day and cast our vote for the better candidate, the lesser of two evils maybe, and then go home on our merry way and believe we've done our patriotic duty because we went out and voted for the best candidate. Folks, those days are over. If ever they were here, they're over. And let it sink in, they will not be back in my lifetime or yours if we are to regain the ancient liberties that we've lost here in America. 
But there is a solution. It's called the Tenth Amendment and states' rights. Thank you, and God bless you.